Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron. We're continuing our sermon series on Bible stories that you can look at in more than one way. And today we have the wild story of King David and um, a terrible crime that he did and how he's confronted with it and some of the consequences that flow from it. I'm going to give you the hyper shortened version of what was uh, has come before in that uh, David sees Bathsheba, the wife of one of his soldiers, Uriah, and they have an affair and Bathsheba gets pregnant and David invites Uriah back, hoping he'll have sex with his wife so that he'll think the child is his, but it doesn't work. So David actually has his general send Uriah to the front lines to be killed in the war. Um, this is obviously a horrible crime and completely immoral and sinful. Um, and this happens in a time when governments had no checks and balances. You know, when the executive uh, commits a wrong, there is no justice department, no legislature with impeachment powers, no court system. The king has sole authority. You either obey the king or you start a civil war. Uh, thank God we do not live in a time like that today. Uh, but there is one supreme authority over the king, God. And God had messengers, sometimes angels, but usually prophets, regular human beings. Nathan was such a prophet sent to David to confront him with his wrongs. And Nathan chose his words very carefully. Um, here I'm going to read from 2 Samuel 11, 26 to 12, 14. When Uriah's wife Bathsheba heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of her mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David, Nathan the prophet. When he came to him, he told the little story. There were two men in a certain town one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. He shared his food with it. It drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. And he must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan looked at David and said, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I appointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by what was doing evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite by the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him by the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them over to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt from the Lord, the son born to you will die. 
This ends our reading for the moment. Nathan's a sneaky prophet. He tells his little parable to appeal to David's conscience, his sense of justice. And it works beautifully. David gets all worked up, furious about the sin of the man in the parable when David exclaims, or when Nathan exclaims, you are the man. <laughs> this is about you and what you did. You had multiple wives, yet you murdered Uriah and stole his wife. Through Nathan, then, God reviews the history of divine graciousness towards David. It is a history dominated by God's giving in contrast to David's taking. It is important to notice that David still has a conscience to appeal to. His sense of right and wrong are intact. He utters three magic words, three vital words, three true words. I have sinned. And if you want a bigger explication of that, read Psalm 51. We don't have time today. When we've sinned, it's good to admit it right away, to repent, to seek forgiveness. And indeed, David is forgiven. I don't want to pass over that point too quickly. God's forgiveness is a beautiful thing, and it can come even for the most heinous of crimes. But that does not mean there will not be consequences. David has introduced corruption, lies, and murder into the monarchy. Things will never be the same after that, as anyone who knows what comes later. There will be incest, fratricide, civil war, and much evil over the coming generations. But chapter 12 focuses on the immediate question. This one week old son Bathsheba had born, or maybe one day old, I'm not even quite clear about that. Hanging in the air is the ominous verse 14, where Nathan the prophet reported that the child will die. How are we to interpret this? Is it a prediction, a fear, a certain edict from God? Perhaps it is simply an assertion that all things happen in God's providence. In any event, the child immediately gets sick. Listen to the rest of the story in verses 15 through 23. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying on the ground in sackcloth. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. His attendants were puzzled. They asked him, why are you acting this way? While well, a child is alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat? He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. This ends our reading. There's this sharp contrast between David's view and the view of the servants. The servants think that David should act normally while the child lives and go into mourning after it dies. The servants do not know the big picture, the pronouncements of God through Nathan. Sometimes we just don't know what's going on in someone else's life. But the servants are thinking only of the present moment. David is confronting the consequences of his past actions and hoping in the future. David has repented and still is repenting. To repent is to turn and go in a new direction. Repentance is dynamic and forward-looking in hope for a new direction away from patterns of brokenness. 
And so David prays really hard and does everything he can think of to implore God to spare the life of the child. But it is not to be. And then after the child dies, David is not callous or stoic. You know, on the contrary, he's been so passionate in his prayer. But he knows that he cannot reverse death, even the death of a child. And he does not let the child's death consume his life. There is something about the death of a child that heightens the offense of death. In grieving the death of the child, it is all too easy to let that child's death become the most important thing about that child so that the child's life is forgotten, however long or short it was. The child's death can also subsume the lives of the parents, becoming the focus of their existence in an unbalanced way. There is grief, of course, and grief can be horrendous, but grief cannot become your whole life. That would be to disrespect life itself, the child's life, your own life, and God's living presence with us. Here's a little biblical trivia for you. If you work out the timing, David and Bathsheba become pregnant almost immediately after the death of their first child. I can't help but notice this profound act oriented toward life, even in the midst of grief. I find it a little inspiring. But then we Christians are always on the lookout for new life. We are forward-looking people. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. God knows what it is to lose a child to death. That is what the cross is all about. The cross that God's son Jesus died on. Christ's resurrection does not remove or nullify the offense of the cross. Resurrection is simply God's refusal to let death have the final word, not just for Jesus, but for all of us. You know, that sounds like a good conclusion to our discussion of David, but what about us? What's your reaction to grief? We aren't all David, of course, but we are able to keep grief and loss in perspective to live out your life and to look for the life of the world to come. We all suffer loss. Some in my congregation have suffered profound loss in the past months and years, and I've so admired their faith that they have brought to their grief. In Elmwood Park, we are staring at another loss, the loss of our church in its current form and in the space in which we're used to worshiping. We'll be closing in November. But like David and Bathsheba looking for new life, we balance our grief with the joys of life and a heartfelt trust in God. I believe we are doing this and that we are all just about where we should be in this process. We are all supporting each other in this time. We will all continue to do so. And it makes me glad to see it. it makes me glad to participate in it. Hebrews 13.1 says, let mutual love continue. I think that sounds like the way to go. And I'll say amen for today. And God bless you all. Bye.